Pressure ulcers present a significant economic, quality of life, and overall healthcare threat. Pressure ulcers were once a problem considered a side effect of aging have captured the attention of the medical community. Pressure ulcers now are more commonly regarded as preventable and unacceptable as they are an indicator of the quality of life. Pressure ulcers occur on any part of the body but are mo more commonly seen over bony prominences such as the occiput, sacrum, elbows, heels, hips, and the ischial tuberosities. One common pressure ulcer that occurs uh, is on the feet due to rubbing of shoes, although most people do not recognize this as a pressure ulcer. Today we are going to talk about causes and risk factors when assessing for a pressure ulcer. Pressure damages predominantly caused by prolonged and unrelieved pressure from any external object against the skin, example bed, mattress, chair, clothing, footwear, medical devices, etc. The applied pressure occludes blood vessels, capillaries and venules in the skin and underlying tissues, which means that there is insufficient or no blood supply to the affected tissues that then die due to lack of oxygen that is ischemia. Further, there is a formation of waste products due to the occlusion of venules, which causes reduced tissue viability, leading to poor tissue repair. It is similar to a boulder being placed on a hose pipe that feeds a garden. Failure to remove the boulder to allow water through results in the garden drying up and dying. Patients who are immobile or have difficulty responding independently to pressure or those who have a neurological deficit and cannot feel the effects of pressure are at immediate risk of developing pressure ulcers. Many factors affect an individual's likelihood of developing pressure ulcers. The more factors involved, the higher the risk and the faster a pressure ulcer is likely to develop. It is therefore essential to carry out a risk assessment that considers all potential contributory factors to an to an appropriate level of care uh, can then can be planned and implemented. Here are some of the main factors. One, friction. Two, shearing. Three, incontinence, moisture and sweating. Four, poor nutrition. Five, underlying comorbidities. And six, medications. Let's talk about each one of them briefly. First is friction. The regular rubbing of the skin removes the epithelial cells and if not protected, damages the cuboidal cells, causing a breach to the skin through which bacteria can enter. If the pressure is applied to this area, then a pressure ulcer develops faster than it would otherwise do. Two, shearing. Shearing happens when two types of tissues are forced in opposite directions, causing tearing, and inflammation at the site of trauma, usually deep within the tissues and commonly at the site of underlying bones. If the pressure is applied to the area, a pressure also develops faster than it would otherwise do if shearing had not occurred. Three, incontinence, moisture and sweating. Moisture that is in constant or regular contact with the skin causes maceration that is waterlogging or excoriation, that is burning, which makes the skin much more vulnerable to pressure. Skin damage from moisture gives the pressure damage a head start. Poor nutrition after immobility, reduced nutritional intake is the next main cause of pressure damage. Poor nutrition leads to lethargy, reduced mobility, reduced cell regeneration, and poor healing rates. It is therefore essential that the patient is encouraged to take adequate nutrition and fluids in order to reduce the risk of developing pressure ulcers and to improve healing rates. The recommended daily intake for a male is around 2000 kilocalories and for females it is around 1600 kilocalories per day. These calories are required to, for daily activities and healthy cell regeneration. If a wound exists, the patient requires 
a higher intake of nutrients, particularly of protein, in order to improve wound healing rates. The next is underlying comorbidities. Many medical conditions make an individual more likely to develop pressure damage than the risk level of a healthy individual. For example, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, other vascular diseases such as vascular dementia and coronary artery disease affect circulation and can affect blood circulation to the skin. When pressure is applied, the already reduced blood supply is reduced even further, making pressure damage occur more quickly. In conditions such as malignancy, organ failure or general malaise, the catabolic rate that is tissue breakdown rate is faster than in a healthy individual which means that there is a need for increased nutrition, yet these patients usually do not have a good appetite, keeping them at a very high risk of developing pressure ulcers. And lastly, about medications. Certain medications are known to impact on the tissue viability of a patient. For example, steroids and cytotoxic drugs and the patient's are at increased risk of developing pressure ulcers if they are not regularly moving or repositioned. Reassessments must be carried out at least weekly, but sooner in the event the patient's condition changes, if pressure ulcers commence or if existing pressure ulcer deteriorates. A patient who's completely immobile, but free from any other risk factors is automatically at risk. In contrast, a patient with a very high risk who is fully mobile and able to respond independently to pressure is at no risk. So if the patient becomes immobile, then he or she develops a pressure ulcer faster than the immobile patient with low or zero risk. Finally, a word of warning. The patients often overlooked as being at no risk are those living with dementia and or learning disabilities as they are usually very mobile. However, these patients, although fully mobile, are at elevated risk due to their inability to respond to the effects of pressure, example, the feeling of numbness while sitting for too long. In summary, when a new patient is being assessed for pressure ulcer, check for these eight risk factors. One, diabetes. Two, mobility. 3. Skin, that is observed for signs of pressure at each position change. 4. Previous pressure ulcer. 5. Sensory perception. 6. Perfusion, that is blood flow. 7. Nutrition. and 8. Moisture. Thank you.